Tonight's another feature interview with Dr. James Lindsay. Are our schools being used to sexually groom children? That's ahead on The Ezra LeVant Show. This free episode of The Ezra LeVant Show is brought to you by... Canadians know the national anthem. They stand in silence to remember those who died for this country. But not every Canadian knows their rights and freedoms. The Freedom Passport will change that. It looks and feels like a Canadian passport, but contains the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms in a portable, easy to read format. The Freedom Passport. Order one for yourself and for all the freedom lovers that you love at freedompassport.ca. Shame on you, you censorious bug. If you come from a sheltered, protected country like we do, Canada, and a sheltered and protected place like I suppose I did growing up, the word grooming, well, it's how you brush your teeth and shave. That's called grooming. Do you have a good haircut? It's maybe what you groom a horse. That's what I would think of. But it was only when I started visiting the United Kingdom a few years ago and started following Tommy Robinson and his battles that I heard of something called grooming gangs. And when I found out what they really were, I thought that was a very inappropriate title for them. Grooming, of course, was a euphemism for raping. As you know, and I'm sorry to talk about such heavy things, these young girls, as young as 11, would be entrapped by these elderly men. And elderly, I mean 40, 50, 60 years old. Oh, would you like a candy? Would you like a drink of alcohol? Would you like a cigarette? Would you like a ride in my Mercedes Benz? And they would be asked in return to maybe lift up their shirt uh, uh, for the man and who would take a photo and say, now I've got you. I'm going to extort you and exploit you. If you don't have sex with me and my friends, I'm going to shame you to the community, to your parents. I'm going to show them the picture I just took of you. And these girls would be entrapped and alcohol and drugs would be used. And they were raped again and again every night by a variety of men over the course of years. This is such a shocking thing for those of us who grew up in happy places like we did here in Canada. The city of Rotherham, UK, population quarter million, more than 1,400 girls were the victims of these grooming gangs. Again, I call them rape gangs because grooming doesn't say what it was, what really was done to them. Grooming refers to the fact that they were tricked and trapped and enticed and then entangled and then exploited. Majid Nawaz, said that reluctance to talk about it is one of the biggest problems. Here's Majid Nawaz a few years ago on his program on the radio station LBC. For too long in this country, uh, we, media, the establishment, society, the chattering classes, the liberal elite, whatever term you want to use, have ignored the issue of grooming gangs, of young, vulnerable teenage girls who have been uh, victimised, drugged and raped and abused. Whether it's the Rotherham case or all the other cases that were replicated across the country, uh, it is both the conclusion of the prosecutor uh, in the Rotherham case, British Pakistani Muslim Nazir Afzal, or indeed the official inquiry into why it took so long for these young, vulnerable, underage girls uh, to get justice. Uh, Both of those concluded that fears of racism prevented us from coming to the defense of vulnerable underage girls. Fears of racism meaning uh, that the state was scared that it would be accused of being racist if it rightly arrested and prosecuted British Pakistani largely, British Pakistani Muslim men uh, in their abuse of underage white teenage girls. And so from fear of appearing racist, there was a silence across the country as multiple cases of grooming gangs emerged up and down the country. Well, he's right, of course. And if you look at the official inquiry in Rotherham, again and again, police and others were afraid to blow the whistle for fear of being called racist. And as Majid says, more than 80 percent of these grooming gangs were Pakistani British men, which made it very difficult to talk about. Does that only happen over there? Or are there grooming gangs in North America too? Well, anyone who followed the uh, 
Weinstein story of the producer in Hollywood knows that women and even girls are abused for their sexuality by powerful men. And of course, there's the case of Jeffrey Epstein, who ran a child trafficking ring for years, even decades. He mysteriously died. They called it suicide in his jail cell. And his uh, right hand woman is in jail right now. But funny enough, not a single one of their clients has been exposed. The only not one we know about for sure is Bill Gates, and we know it because his wife divorced him over it. Here's Melinda Gates on the subject. It was also widely reported that Bill had a, a friendship or business or some kind of contact with Jeffrey Epstein and that you were not, uh, that that was very upsetting to you. Did that play a role in the, in the divorce at all in this process? Yeah, as I said, it's not one thing, it was many things. But I did not like uh, that he'd had meetings with Jeffrey Epstein, no. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you made that clear to him? I made that clear to him. I also met Jeffrey Epstein exactly one time. Did you? Yes, because I wanted to see who this man was. And um, I regretted it from the second I stepped in the door. He was abhorrent. He was evil personified. I had nightmares about it afterwards. So, you know, my heart breaks for these young women because that's how I felt. And here I'm an older woman. My God, I feel terrible for those young women. It's awful. You felt that the moment you walked in. I didn't he realize was awful. that. Yeah. And you shared that with Bill and he still continued to spend time with him? Any of the questions remaining about what Bill's relationship there was, those are for Bill to answer. Okay. But I made it very clear how I felt about him. Mm -hmm. Well, why can't we talk about those things? Why aren't journalists talking about what is an enormous story, the predation of our children by powerful people, usually very powerful men in the case of Weinstein and Epstein? Well, here's a reporter at ABC News caught in a hot mic moment. You'll remember this video where she said she had the story. But ABC nixed it. Remember this? I've had the story for three years. I've had this interview with Virginia Roberts. We would not put it on the air. Um, first of all, I was told, who's Jeffrey Epstein? No one knows who that is. This is a stupid story. Um, then the palace found out that we had her whole allegations about Prince Andrew and threatened us a million different ways. Um, we were so afraid we wouldn't be able to interview Kate and Will say, oh, that we that also quashed yes. the story. Yes. And then um, and then Alan Dershowitz was also implicated in because of the planes. She told me everything. She had pictures. She had everything. She was in hiding for 12 years. We convinced her to come out. We convinced her to talk to us. Um, it was unbelievable what we had. Clinton. We had everything. I, I tried for three years to get it on to no avail. And now it's all coming out. And it's like these new revelations. And I freaking had all of it. I, I, I'm so pissed right now. Like every day I get more and more pissed because I'm just like, oh my God. We, it was, um, what, what we had was unreal. Other women backing it up. Hey, yep. Brad Edwards, the attorney, three years ago saying, like, on, like, we, there will come a day when we will realize Jeffrey Epstein was the most prolific pedophile this country has ever known. And I had it all three years ago. I show you all these things because our next guest, who will be our feature interview for today, has been talking about grooming in the United States and in Canada to a lesser extent. Grooming not done in secret like the rape rooms of Rotherham, not done in secret like on Jeffrey Epstein's island, but out in the open, in our schools, on TikTok and other youthful Twitter accounts and social media platforms, grooming not being done in secret, but explicitly. And for talking about that, for using that phrase grooming, he was censored and deplatformed. I'll introduce the man to explain what happened himself. His name is Dr. James Lindsay. You'll recall we've had him on the show before. He's the boss of newdiscourses.com, and he joins us now via Skype from Knoxville, Tennessee. Dr. Lindsay, what a pleasure to have you back on the show. I hope you don't mind my lengthy introduction. The idea of grooming, of slowly breaking down children, entrapping them, entangling them, it's shocking whenever we see it, but we always think it's a faraway thing, could never happen here. It actually is happening right here, isn't it? Right under our noses. Yeah, very unfortunately, and like you said, through the schools. And so what we are seeing, just to tie into the, um, 
the connotation of grooming that, that we were just discussing, because we're seeing story after story after story now of sexual abuse occurring in schools, sometimes with hundreds of victims coming across uh, many different states. And I don't think that this is wholly surprising. This isn't quite what I got kicked off of Twitter for. I was using, as you started out by saying, you know, grooming your beard or grooming your, your hair or grooming a horse. There are other meanings of the word grooming. We used to say, for example, that maybe, you know, your favorite politician, whoever it might be, maybe Mitch McConnell or somebody has groomed the successor, has kind of brought them into the fold, the way of thinking, the, the mentality that, you know, he had put forth before he retires or whatever it might be. And so there's this idea of professional grooming, and there's an idea actually of cult grooming. You don't merely, uh, you know, entice perhaps a young person or a vulnerable person for sexual exploits. You can also entice them to join a cult. And this is something that has been going on, obviously, for a very long time, probably as long as there have been people. Uh, and it's been a rampant problem in the United States. We've had the, the Scientology cult exposed. We know that the it and other cults prey upon vulnerable people who have recently moved, so they've upended their lives. But what we have going on in the schools is this kind of weird tandem uh, problem where you have a, a cult of belief about the organization of society, the social constructedness of society, about um, sex and gender and sexuality in those regards in particular being taught as though it is some form of, as they call it, comprehensive sexuality education that, you know, maybe if you don't feel like a boy, even though you are a boy, then maybe you are secretly a girl. And then kind of this whole process begins. You induce this vulnerability and pull these kids into these after school clubs and they are socially transitioning kids at school while hiding from their parents the fact that they've changed their name, changed their pronouns, or maybe even depending on the school system, are beginning to take pharmaceuticals that maybe block their puberty, maybe they're antidepressants or psychoactive drugs, maybe they eventually can include cross-sex hormones. Then the schools are facilitating this after inducing these ideas into the children's minds. And so now you have this kind of cross-purpose sex, gender, sexuality as a form of identity cult that, of course, opens up vulnerability to predation, you know, kind of physical and sexual predation, which just to bring it full circle to any other cult, the vast majority of those end up with the cult leader, you know, basically asking for people's wives and daughters for his own entertainment. So this is this is a absolute catastrophe that's happening out in the open in our schools through our entertainment under the guise of creating empathy and acceptance and inclusion for LGBT people. But in fact, that is mutilating the minds and eventually bodies of young people across our countries. You, you know, you're, you're so right. I mean, even Freud, who's regarded as by many as a, an extremist or even a pervert, even he talked about a period of latency. I mean, children are not sexual. By definition, they're in the age of innocence, uh, uh, an Eden time before the, the fall. And to inject sexuality at such a young age, I mean, here in the province of Ontario, um, they introduced the six genders. I challenge you to name which, well, you probably know what six they're talking about. I, um, and gay isn't a gender, by the way. You tell people that and they say, well, what are the six genders? Like that, they're teaching that. They're teaching that as young as grade one. Why are you doing that? And it's got nothing to do with being straight or gay. It's about sexualizing young people. And why would you do that? Why would you break down normal barriers? And I think your cult analogy works. A lot of cults have a sexual purpose for the leader. And you break down norms, for example, monogamy norms. No, well, the boss of the cult gets to have sex with everyone. Well, what are these other norms that are being broken down by sexualizing children? I think that is the phrase grooming. You're you're breaking someone down and reforming them. Now, you, there can be good grooming, like you said, Mitch McConnell is grooming his successor. You're, he's teaching them all the ways, and he's going to pass the baton to him. And it's, you know, it's improve. It's like a mentor and a protege. But the kind of grooming in a cult, and the kind of grooming in in these sex or orientation hypersexual school classes, it is designed to to t turn the student into an object of sexuality. I believe that. Yeah, there are there are actually several purposes. And, and, and it's, it's very important for people to realize that 
Um, this is a purposed attempt to transform the uh, views of our children in, in many regards. And people have been studying, when I say people, I should hesitate to use that particular word because Marxists have been studying for over a century, uh, going back to, for example, uh, Wilhelm Reich uh, with his book about sexual liberation and then following you know, George Lukács and the Hungarian Revolution using education to sexualize children in Hungary in, the, in 1919. And then Herbert Marcuse exploring this idea, tapping back to Freud in uh, the 1950s in his book, Heroes and Civilization. And the, the power that comes with sexualizing a child, whether for predatory purposes or not, is absolutely actually outstanding. You can sever that child from a sense of the safe boundaries that you need to develop in a healthy fashion as a child. And so you can, in some sense, if you take the borrow from the Marxist language, you can estrange a child from himself, but you can also estrange him from these anchors. And this is what cults always do, such as family and religion, that, and, and even the prevailing culture of, say, Canada or the United States, that might anchor them back and keep them from joining the cult. The cult always has the same program. The cult is always to draw people in using their vulnerability, and then to slowly slowly give them acceptance in the cult and cause distrust and separation from people who might wake them up and keep them out of it. And so the goal is to, you know, in the, with these children is to teach them sexual themes, teach them that there are six genders. And when they go home and they tell their parents, I'm a, you know, demigender, or whatever made up term that they apply, the parents say, what is that? That's not a thing. Then it's mom, you don't understand. So you sever from the parents, and then if they say invoke the Bible or they invoke, you know, culture, the long-standing Canadian or American culture, well, the kids will say, well, that's obsolete. It's different now. Those are oppressive forms that you know that, that, that hurt people like me, and you just don't understand. And things change, are different, and you got brainwashed into a bad world. And so you can actually separate a generation from their parents, from their culture, from their religion, but importantly from themselves. This is inappropriate relationships, whether sexual or, or emotional, with children inappropriate boundary setting with children and the inability to help them navigate the, the structures and boundaries and categories that they're forming in life in those important developmental phases is how you induce personality disorders. It is how you actually psychologically damage a child to where they can't cope and function normally throughout the rest of their lives. Now, the people that are doing this know this because those people become moldable, they become activists, they become um, inconsolable, and they'll constantly demand, you know, more and more being taken care of. If they become narcissists as a result, then we all see what happens when you deal with narcissists. The focus is always on them. So this is a deliberate push. The um, predation, the sexual predation that can come along with this, I think, is um, in a sort of very disgusting sense of bonus for some predators who take advantage of the circumstance. But the ultimate purpose is actually political. And it's been well thought out and it's been utilized for over 100 years in different Marxist revolutions. As a matter of fact, the Bolsheviks used it in Russia in 1917 and afterwards. And then Lenin had to turn it off because it was too powerful, too destabilizing. And then Mao made the same mistake in China and they had to stop doing it there as well because, again, it was too powerful. It's too destabilizing. It's too destructive. And the fact that they're doing this whole hog to our children, they're socially transitioning them, they're doing so-called gender affirmative treatment and care at school, and then hide this from your parents, they tell them, don't tell your parents. And in some states like California, they're working diligently to get kids to understand that they can get taken out of their parents' home if the parents aren't affirming. And in fact, California is working on a bill now to make it legal for them to take kids from other states as LGBT sanctuaries. Uh, so the kid comes in and declares themselves a refugee for LGBT reasons, gets to San Francisco or Los Angeles or something, and a caseworker immediately makes them a ward of the state of California, and some parent in Iowa has now lost their child. And this is extraordinarily alarming, but it's also blatantly called grooming. But if you call it what it is, because you're calling it what it is, then the big social media platforms will kick you off, because they, for some reason, are very invested in protecting this. And there are, I think, a number of reasons why they might do that. But ultimately, the goal is to disrupt society, to disrupt families, to disrupt and end faith, to segregate the younger generation from the older and to segregate them from even themselves so they don't know who they are. Hmm. And you yourself have been banned. You had quite a large Twitter following. You were literally banned for using the word grooming to describe this. I want to show you said so many interesting things. I want to show some proof points. Here's a video uh, from a hospital 
basically saying, yeah, we're going to we're you just say the word and we're going to get right in. Here's a video. I, I believe this is from a Boston hospital. Take a look at this. A child will often know that they are transgender from the moment that they have any ability to express themselves. And parents will often tell us this. We have parents who tell us that their kids, they knew from the minute they were born practically. And actions like refusing to get a haircut or standing to urinate, trying to stand to urinate, refusing to stand to urinate, trying on siblings' clothing, uh, playing with the quote opposite gender toys, things like that. There is more and more a group of adolescents that we are seeing that really are coming to the realization that they might be trans or gender diverse a little bit later on in their life. So what we're seeing from them is that they always sort of knew something was maybe off and didn't have the understanding to know that they might be trans or have a different gender identity than the one they had been assigned. So that is a, a growing population that they are that we are seeing and that's being recognized as being trans and able to be treated. Gender-affirming hysterectomy is very similar to most hysterectomies that occur. A hysterectomy itself is the removal of the uterus, the cervix, which is the opening of the uterus, and the fallopian tubes, which are attached to the sides of the uterus. Some gender-affirming hysterectomies will also include the removal of the ovaries, but that's technically a separate procedure called a bilateral oophorectomy. And not every gender-affirming hysterectomy includes that, and people who are getting gender-affirming hysterectomies do not have to have their ovaries removed. The idea of uh, teachers deliberately doing this and hiding things from parents and even dispensing drugs. This is not a conspiracy theory. A lot of these teachers boast about it. There's an interesting account called Libs of TikTok. It's the, you know, I don't even think liberal is the right word, progressives who are boasting about what they're doing in schools. I don't know why they boast about it. They think maybe parents aren't watching these TikTok videos. And I suppose in most cases that's true. Here's a, a sample of some libs of TikTok um, talking about, you know, a, a campaign to sexualize their children and even to hand out pharmaceuticals to block their sexuality. Take a look at these. We need to talk about what's happening in Texas. The governor is trying to take away vital health care for transgender kids and labeling it as child abuse. Giving gender affirming care to transgender children is medically necessary and supports their health and well-being. Did you know in many states you can get certain types of health care without your parents being there or ever finding out about it? It's today's Daily Doctor Facts. To figure out if you can get care sans parentals, go to your state health department website and find the laws related to teen health, consent, and confidentiality. So, with hormones, um, the mental health piece kind of ties into that because we're able to give two letters, either for hormones, or for surgery, readiness, things like that. And we delve deeper into it with our amazing team from UCI Gender Diversity Program. So, some of the folks in the UCI Gender Diversity Program are Greg Cervantes, who goes over the, the insurance part, Jeff Vu, who's a nurse practitioner, Dr. Hunt, Dr. Lynn Hunt, who's a pediatrician. We have Abigail, Catherine, and Caroline as well, who are med students who have been incredible and teach amazing information about hormones. So the hormone section, we talk about estrogen, we talk about um, testosterone, we talk about blockers, we talk about um, stopping puberty for our youth, ways in order to navigate that, what hormones will do, what they won't do, the timelines and things of that nature. Really exciting. I'm a doctor and apparently the state of Texas needs to reconsider what it considers child abuse. Because you know what's abusive? Ignoring the needs of your child when your child is telling you what they need. And engaging in behavior as a parent that could lead them to unalive themselves. Over 80% of trans youth have admitted to having thoughts about unaliving themselves and over 50% have actually attempted it. And these individuals denying them care that we know is life-saving. In my last video, I told you how adults are my problem and I have to get them to take me seriously, which means I have to consistently remind people to take me seriously. I have to set up boundaries. If people do not use the correct pronouns, the correct language, 
the correct title, the correct name, then sometimes I am forced to remind them to. And if they continue to refuse, and I don't mean by accident, I mean to actively refuse, then I get to a point where I maybe have to cut them out of my life. Kids, their brains are more elastic than that. They get it, they don't care. They're just here for a good time. And the queer ones, they see me. And they saw me before I was ready to be seen. So I do them a service now. And they call me Mix. I'm like very out at work. Um, I, at least at my teaching job, I'm very out. I wear my pronouns and stuff. Um, and I'm like, I like correct the kids and the, like the kids have gotten to like correcting each other. And it was like so awesome today. We were, I was in charge of our like active activity and one of the kids referred to me as a girl and one of my kids was like, Jamie doesn't have a gender. Jamie's not a girl. Oh my God. And like the kid was just like, what do you mean? And she was just like, Jamie doesn't have a gender. Jamie is not a girl. I like the way that like, the way that has me is so emotional. <laughs> I think it's madness, but let me just tell you a quick story. I know, I, I'm sure you know this, Dr. Lindsay, because you know these things. In the Soviet Union, their version of Boy Scouts, the young pioneers, they wore a little lapel pin, all the kids. And it was of a young boy named Pavel Morozov. Maybe you know the story. He was a Ukrainian boy. I forget how old he was. He was very young. And the story is probably embellished by the Soviets for propaganda reason, but I'm sure there's a grain of truth under it. Pavel Morozov overheard his parents criticizing Stalin's plans to forcibly collectivize Ukrainian farms in what became known as the Holodomir, the, uh, the forced famine, the engineered famine. So he overheard his parents speaking ill of Stalin's plans. And because he had been alienated by authorities from his family and taught to love the state instead, he informed on him. He, he, he ratted. He told the police about his parents and they arrested them and sent them off to Siberia. And Pavel Morozov was given the title by Lenin, sorry, by Stalin, um, informant number one. Now, we use the word informant as an insult. He's an informant. Don't trust him. He's a snitch. No, in the Soviet Union, that was the greatest achievement. And so every young pioneer, every boy in Russia, when they would join scouts, would wear a little picture of Pavel Morozov in a lapel. Like it, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be a neutral symbol or an outdoorsy symbol or even Lenin. It was Pavel Morozov. The role model for a Soviet boy was someone who would not only alienate their family, but throw their family in prison because their higher loyalty was to Stalin. And until the end, until 1989, that was what young boys took home from Boy Scouts, young pioneers. Imagine the terror that would put in a family. You say child welfare services taking kids away uh, whose parents say, don't, you know, you're not a demi gender, whatever. Imagine the terror that the KGB would come and throw you, take your kids away and throw you in Siberia because your kid was told He's been weaponized against you. I thought I'd, I, I'm sure some of my viewers have heard me talk about Pavel Morozov before. That was the hero of the Boy Scouts of Russia. Yeah, that's exactly the, the mentality behind a lot of this, uh, that you, you can put this pressure on, on children, whether it's through their racial identity, whether it's through these kind of sexual things, and you can make them feel more and more uncomfortable. This is what Mao Zedong did as well. It wasn't just Stalin who told this. He created positive and negative identity categories. And if your parents were in a negative identity category, then you were in a negative identity category. And they would mistreat you at school and give favored treatment to the people who turned the parents in or who uh, bullied their parents or who went and desecrated a temple or who destroyed a statue of, of the, you know, the old culture. And so this is a common tactic within communism. But in order to do that, you have to break the loyalty to the parents first. And what the communists have understood for, again, a century is that there is no tool more powerful for breaking the loyalty to your parents 
than to tap into the sexuality of children. And now you you mentioned that, that Sigmund Freud, for example, no no hero of history, uh, that Sigmund Freud understood that there was a latency period and, and a period during you know an age of innocence in children. And what, what, what you'll find if you look in the literature, the queer theory in education literature, as I have done, what you'll find is that there is a relentless attack on childhood innocence. In fact, there is an attempt to bring this ideology called queer theory, which is a Marxism, uh, a theory of Marxism that attacks the idea of people being able to be considered normal versus abnormal. And so they, they, they've got this entire attempt to bring queer theory to bear on childhood development psychology so that they can rewrite childhood development psychology in their terms so that we can abolish the innocence of children, so that they can go after children. And when you start to abolish the innocence of children and you start to introduce sexual conversations with children, not only are you psychologically damaging them, not only are you leading them down a primrose path for many kids to physical damage through pharmaceuticals and through uh, surgical tools, but or even self-harm, you are also, in fact, um, opening them up to the kind of predation that we kind of started the discussion with. Uh, it makes it less able for them to determine that Mrs. So-and-so at school said something sexual and that's highly inappropriate and therefore I need to tell my mom. In fact, the mentality now is that the, that, that the parents are the thing that children have to be protected from and the schools are the thing protecting children from their parents. So I thought I'd bring you an update of the whole gender identity situation and how I'm handling it in my classroom. So the student who originally asked me about, you know, pronouns and identifiers and if I had them I went up to her and I asked what the best way for me to go about this with students was and they told me that I should take take the time and individually asked each student privately to know what their identity was how I should refer to them and how I should refer to them around their parents because that's a different issue and they're transmitting this this mentality through the sexuality through these other uh forms of cult grooming and through these other messages. And it's an extraordinarily dangerous and an extraordinarily evil program that I think we need to be far more aware of and far more ready and eager to stop. This isn't about politics. This isn't about left and right. This is about children and protecting children. And as you see, large corporations such as Twitter are actively complicit in the sexualization of children and protecting the people who are actively engaged in the sexualization of children for these various purposes. Hmm. You know, um, Bill Maher, who's got a show on, on HBO he's, uh, forever, and he's not just liberal. I would call him libertine. There's nothing he doesn't like to do, sex, drugs, whatever. Um, there's certain things about him I, I, uh, that I view are quite principled, actually, in his libertinism. He's a free speech um, absolutist, which I admire. But he, at the end of it, maybe it's because he's, you know, in his fifties. So maybe he, maybe some common sense. Maybe you can't, you can't live that long without having some common sense uh, temper your liberalism. He did a segment the other day where he talked about this transgenderism, and he observed that it's not a uniform phenomenon. It is absolutely related to what did a teacher in a certain school say? There are clusters. Is there a particularly aggressive, sophisticated groomer in a particular school, in a particular class, in, even in a state, let's say? And the fact that it is not a natural phenomenon, but a stimulated one, proved to Bill Maher that this whole thing, it's, it's not fake, it's just engineered. Here, here's a clip of Bill Maher saying this, and and I say again, Bill Maher couldn't be more sex friendly, gay friendly, you know, live your life. But he draws the line at kids. Take a look. Dr. Erica Anderson is a prominent 71 year old clinical psychologist who is herself transgender, and who now says, "I think it's gone too far." The L.A. Times summarizes. She's come to believe that some children identifying as trans are falling under the influence of their peers and social media. If you attend a small dinner party of typically very liberal upper-income Angelinos, it is not uncommon to hear parents who each have a trans kid having a conversation about that. What are the odds of that happening in Youngstown, Ohio? If this spike in trans children is all natural, why is it regional? 
either Ohio is shaming them or California is creating them. <laughs> it, it's like that day we suddenly all needed bottled water all the time. If we can't admit that in certain enclaves there is some level of trendiness to the idea of being anything other than straight, then this is not a serious science-based discussion. It's a blow being struck in the culture wars using children as cannon fodder. I don't understand parents who won't let their nine-year-old walk to the corner without a helmet, an EpiPen, and a GPS tracker. <laughs> And God forbid their lips touch dairy, but... <laughs> but hormone blockers and genital surgery? Fine. I'm sure the vast majority of parents do not take this lightly. And that is very hard to know when something is real or just a phase. And I understand being trans is different. It's innate. But kids do also have phases. They're kids, it's all phases. The dinosaur phase, the Hello Kitty phase. One day they want to be an astronaut, the next day you can't get them to leave their room. Gender fluid, kids are fluid about everything. If kids knew what they wanted to be at age eight, the world would be filled with cowboys and princesses. You know, I think that's gonna put him on the, on the, on, he's no longer a protected person, uh, Bill Maher. I wonder if he'll be canceled or if he still earns too much money. You know, um, Elon Musk used the phrase mind virus the other day. And I think there's something to it. You know, there's a trite old saying, smiles are, are contagious, laughter is contagious, but, it, but it's actually true. You know, you see someone smiling, you're more likely to smile. You see someone laughing, you actually want to laugh along. You see someone yawning, you yawn. If someone in your circle commits suicide, now the idea has been implanted in your group, and now it's an acceptable thing to do. And you see suicide clusters. We see that sometimes in Indian reserves in Canada. I, depression can be a mind virus. Um, I think that we underestimate how powerful persuasion and peers are. And I think that that's not something that people on the right think about a lot. We're just numbers and you know physics and math. We're not feelings and peer pressure and emotion and and compliance but if anything if we've learned anything from the last two years of lockdowns it's that the herd mentality and being in the in group is the most powerful thing in the world and that's what's going on with this with this grooming yeah you mentioned actually suicide clusters and that makes me feel like i should point out that in fact that level of grooming is happening as well to kind of connect many of the dots that you just put together in the program that they're calling social and emotional learning, which should raise the hair on the back of everybody's neck, uh, they actually do repeated surveys of children about how they feel about their social and emotional circumstances in life. That, in fact, is required by law under the Every Student Succeeds Act in the United States, that they survey these children and gather lots of information about them. And one of the questions that they often ask these young kids is, I mean, many times throughout a single school year in surveys, do you think about suicide? How often do you think about suicide? These kinds of things. So you talk about implanting those ideas into these kids' heads who are allegedly at-risk kids because they have to be classified at risk to receive the money that comes in from the federal government through, say, ESSER three funding or the CARES Act, which is misappropriated pandemic money coming in under the, the guise of helping them psychologically and socio uh, socially. Allegedly, they've been injured by the trauma of the pandemic, and therefore you have to intervene this way. But they ask them repeatedly, are you suicidal? Do you feel suicidal? And they, they say that this is for prevention. But in, as a matter of fact, it plants the idea. Then there's this program that is, is often tied in with this. The World Economic Forum advertises it as one of its chief ed tech success stories. It's called the Trevor Project. The Trevor Project... Um, it's supposed to be a suicide prevention hotline that children can use, especially if they're LGBTQ is the point. And it has all kinds of features that enable them to have these ongoing dialogues, which are always gender affirming, that are always, you know, this kind of queer theory affirming grooming behavior. I, in fact, get in trouble for calling it the Groomer Project instead of the Trevor Project. And it has features that were at a push of a button, the child can completely delete the entire chat history so that no parent can ever find it has all kinds of this kind of uh, stuff built into it. 
And it's very suspicious that you have people, again, anonymously talking to children in a very vulnerable state to affirm their feelings about sex, gender, and sexuality that they claim that they're having. And then it's built and designed to be able to hide from the parents. And this is a selling point to the children. And on selling points, I'll even add, there's another academic paper that I read recently in a major journal, not some fringe journal. It's in the journal Curriculum Inquiry, which is in the leading journal of curriculum and education. And it was called Drag Pedagogy. It came out in the beginning of the year last year, 2021. Drag Pedagogy. And it talks about the use of drag queen story hour. And in fact, in that paper, I, I urge people to go look this up and read it. It's actually open access. It's free. Anybody can read it. You don't have to have an account. You can just go look up Drag Pedagogy by Will Miss Hot Mess. I'm not kidding. And you can read this paper. And they say in there that they, they use the fact that, it indu- that, that, they, that the idea of generating LGBT empathy as a selling point, as a marketing strategy. But of course, that's not what it's really for. They say that in the paper. They actually tell you that. They say that they market it as being family friendly. But what they actually mean is family in the sense of the queer family on the street that you leave your real family for. This is things that they're actually putting in writing and publishing in academic journals about what they're doing with children. And it's just grotesque to see millions upon millions of people just falling for it by not taking literally a small number of minutes, an hour out of their day to go look into this and read about it before they get militant about it like an idiot on social media. Uh, So I encourage people to go look at that. This is not what it seems. And the Trevor Project is not what it seems. And this suicide kind of mental illness, self-harm, anorexia, but then transition kind of cult grooming that's been taking place on social media for many years, that many, many children have been harmed and pulled into, that now involves this kind of you know, kind of an alleged magical pathway out of all your troubles through becoming a lifelong pharmaceutical patient, which will, in the end, force you to have expensive lifelong medical care, which will force you to agitate for socialist single-payer medicine uh, when you, just like they agitate for student loan forgiveness. Um, So you're creating these activists with this program. I urge people to go look into this because this has been a deliberate and malicious and extraordinarily damaging uh, grooming project that's, like you said, happening out in the open, happening at scale, happening deliberately through multi-billion dollar funding programs like social emotional learning through the schools, which should be illegal anyway. You shouldn't be practicing psychology as a teacher in front of groups of students in a non-therapeutic, uncontrolled space. That's That should be felonious, not something encouraged. So people really need to kind of become more aware. And this is why I spent so much time talking about it. This is why I got kicked off of Twitter for talking about it. Um, People need to become much more aware of just what's going on and that that it's extremely damaging and it's also disgustingly purposed. It's not just happening. It's not just social contagion. Um, like I said, they pressure the kids about their racial identity and give them a resolution in adopting a sexual identity or a gender transition identity. I even saw the other day um, being non-binary is racist. Being you know, white people aren't allowed to be non-binary. For, for example, being um, a tomboy has a long history of racism. These are articles they're putting out in teen geared magazines. They're telling people, kids, vulnerable 13, 14 year old girls, 12 year old girls, this. So they're uncomfortable about their racial identity because of the critical race theory put onto them. They can't just become bisexual. They can't just become non binary and kind of wash out, which is already bad enough. No, they have to go full into transition or they're a racist in some way or another. In other words, they have to walk this path that is psychologically mutilating. And if they go far enough down the path, physically mutilating and possibly sterilizing uh, so that they can't have children as they grow up. This is horrific what they're doing. And there's no excuse. This isn't it's not for LGBT empathy. This is to destroy kids in a targeted and malicious way. I find this all very troubling, you know, just uh, it makes me think uh, about a year ago, we had an incident with the Montreal police and uh, we're suing them and uh, one of the things they did is we had a teenager with our team uh, who was 16 at the time and the police separated her from the rest of us searched her uh, belongings and interrogated her and we were calling out against us but we were not permitted to intervene and the idea of police uh, interrogating and searching a minor child without a guardian there is outrageous to me and it's one of the things we're suing over now she was a savvy 16 year old and it was it was not an extended period of time 
But it still deeply outrages me that the police would do that. And imagine, and that's a 16-year-old basically having her civil rights violated. But imagine a 10, 11, 12, 13, 14-year-old being separated from a guardian and subject to someone else's agenda, not once for 10 minutes or 20 minutes, but every week for years, hidden from guardians. If it outrages me that our 16-year-old colleague was treated this way, surely it should outrage us that six-year-old, 10-year-olds are being treated this way in these drag queen events where children, and I say to people who say, you know, and I know that they kicked you off of Twitter because they elided the word groomer with an anti-gay epithet, but I say to people who are having trouble understanding that, would you feel any better if minor children were taken to heterosexual strip clubs? Would you feel any better if a 10-year-old girl was taken to a strip club where women strippers were stripping naked? It would be just as inappropriate, and we would call that child trafficking. I find this a deeply troubling subject. And listen, I wanted to talk to you today about a number of things, but I'm glad we talked about this. I know there's this is a focus in the United States because you have some political leaders pushing back. I mean, I, I think uh, the governor of Virginia won in part because of what parents saw in their kids' schools. Every Kids were at home taking school over Zoom or Skype, and parents saw for the first time the kind of crazy stuff being taught, whether it was critical race theory or, or sexual uh, critical theory. And parents said, this is madness. And I think that's one reason why Virginia, which has been a blue state for 20 years, went red. And I know Ron DeSantis and talked about this. He's banning uh, doctors who engage in the kind of mutilation surgeries you're talking about. I think this is happening in Canada just as much as in the United States, but we lack the political courage or the, the journalism to stand up to it. We lack any candidates for you know, school boards to stand up to it. And I think there's nothing more important than protecting our children. And, and why do we assume it only happens somewhere else? I find this a troubling subject, but I'm glad we tucked into it. Uh, how can we follow your work now that you're taken off of Twitter? What's the best way to follow what you do? Well, I mean, I strongly encourage people to go to the website, which is newdiscourses.com, as you mentioned. Uh, that's where all of my long form and much of my short form written and audio content gets put out. Uh, I have a YouTube channel that is largely those podcasts on YouTube, but sometimes there's other material. It is the New Discourses channel on YouTube. It just crossed 100,000 subscribers. So uh, thank you to those people who have subscribed and welcome to new subscribers who want to join in. It's, it's a growing party. Uh, I'm kind of still all over the other social media platforms, the kind of fringe social media, the truth social, the getter, all of this, at Conceptual James still. I'm not as active. I've actually, it's almost like somebody grabbed me by the shirt and shook me for a moment. And I kind of realized that social media is just so poisonous that I just, I've wanted out. And now I have the excuse to do a lot less of it. So I'm kind of happy to be doing much less of it. And don't anticipate a big return. I do want to mention, though, I know we're winding up, but I want to mention that it is worse in Canada than it is in the United States. Um, for whatever set of reasons, lack of political courage, people being too nice, whatever it is. I have a friend, Chris Elston. Uh, he's known as Billboard Chris on social media. He wears these billboards that children shouldn't, you know, consent. They can't consent to puberty blockers, et cetera. And I met with him recently in Tampa, Florida, just to tell a quick story. And he was going to go out with this huge crowd of Democratic protesters outside of an event we were in. And he was going to do his signs and video and all of this. And somebody asked, aren't you afraid that you're going to get assaulted? And he said, no, I'm not in Canada. Hmm. I'm in the United States. I'll be fine. And he was. In fact, nobody, big people yelled at him a little bit, nothing else. And then he, he went back to Vancouver uh, the following week. He went home and he went out for an event and was standing on a street corner and got physically assaulted and punched uh, more than once. Each time he went out in Canada, he gets physically assaulted. That doesn't happen in the United States. It's actually worse in Canada. So your viewers should be aware that Canada is far much worse on this issue than even the United States for all this crazy, dangerous stuff that I mentioned. So follow Chris as well, Billboard Chris. You can find him that way. All right. Well, I'm glad we had this conversation. It's great to catch up with you. Next time we talk, we'll branch out into other issues. But this was on my mind because it was the reason you were banned from TikTok. Dr. James Lindsay of NewDiscourses.com. Great to catch up with you today. Yes, always. Thank you. All right. Well, there you have it, our feature interview with Dr. James Lindsay. What do you think? 
Do you think he's um, overstating things? Do you think he's exaggerating? Do you think he's infusing his comments with some sort of bigotry or hatred? Or do you think he is actually doing the opposite, ringing the alarm about what's happening to our children and deliberately being kept away from us? What do you think? Let me know. Send me an email to Ezra at rebelnews.com. Until next time, on behalf of all of us here at Rebel World Headquarters, you at home, good night and keep fighting for freedom. This free episode of The Ezra Levant Show is brought to you by... Canadians know the national anthem. They stand in silence to remember those who died for this country. But not every Canadian knows their rights and freedoms. The Freedom Passport will change that. It looks and feels like a Canadian passport, but contains the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms in a portable, easy-to-read format. The Freedom Passport. Order one for yourself and for all the freedom lovers that you love at freedompassport.ca.